Can you tell me what you do, Hanan? Do you work or are you a student? Yes, I'm a student. I'm studying medicine because I want to be a doctor. At the moment, I'm studying English as well because I hope to do part of my degree course in Australia. And where do you come from? I come from Mutra in Oman. Can you describe Mutra a little bit for me? Yes. It's quite a large city by the sea and also near the mountains. It's very beautiful and very old. It's very hot in the summer, but the winter is usually very pleasant. Also, Mutra is an important port. Can you tell me what you do, Quan? Do you work or are you a student? I'm a student. I'm studying economics at Chonju University at the moment. And where do you come from, Quan? I come from a small village near Chonju in Korea. Can you describe your village to me? Well, it's in the mountains. The people work as farmers and they are very friendly. It's a good place to live, but not much happens there. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Wallabaloo Conference on Mastering Computer Languages. I hope you all had a good trip. Before we get underway with today's program, let me fill you in as to what's on tap for tomorrow, Sunday, February 19th. At 9am, right here in the main hall, we'll be hearing a lecture from Dr John Smith about Computer as Teacher. Professor Smith from the University of Melbourne is a world-class expert in the field of computer-assisted education, and his talk promises to be both stimulating and informative. Immediately afterwards, at 10.30, there will be a presentation of papers by various delegates. That, however, will take place in the garden room on the ground floor. If you don't yet know, the garden room is also called the ballroom and will be gathering at the west end, the slightly raised area called level 2. Just look for the crowd. If you get lost, there are signs in the foyer. After all that thinking, talking and listening, I expect everyone will be a bit weary. So at 11.15 there will be a break for coffee, cookies and other light refreshments. These will be available at the aptly named refreshment stand, placed by the door back here in the main hall. Also, if you choose to skip the formal lunch, you can buy a packed lunch at the stand for a reasonable price. I strongly urge you, however, to join us at the formal lunch. That won't be till one o'clock sharp, so you have time to stroll about town a bit. We'll be eating at the Seaview restaurant. The restaurant is located right here in the hotel on the top floor. It's a good dozen flights of stairs, so I suggest you take the lift on the ground floor, eh? If you're not fond of fish, there's an all-you-can-eat barbecue available as well. They even offer wallaby meat. After lunch, we'll troop back downstairs to level 2 in the ballroom for the presentation of further papers, which will begin at 2pm. Please try to be on time. I know you'll be a bit tired after lunch, but the ballroom echoes so with people coming in late. Thank you in advance. 
Once we've heard the papers, we'll break for afternoon tea at 3:10 p.m. No need to walk. The manager of the refreshment stand has graciously agreed to have tea served in the ballroom. He's even promised us some special scones baked from a recipe of his dear old Scottish grandmother. Then, tea being drunk and scones munched, we'll retire here to the main hall for some closing remarks and questions. So, by five o'clock, we should have the conference wrapped up. But the fun isn't over. This is Australia, mates. We'll be flocking to the hotel's own Palm Lounge on the east side of the foyer for an informal reception. You can relax, mingle with the other delegates, and let your hair down a bit. This will run from 5:10 to 6:10, though you're free to stay as long as you like. The lounge manager has informed me that for the duration of the actual reception, you can have all-you-can-drink beer for twenty dollars with purchase of an advance ticket. You will hear someone talking about a colour exhibition. Now, I'd like to welcome onto our show today Darren Whitlock, who's going to tell us about a very vibrant exhibition. Thanks, Melanie. Yes, in fact, it's an exhibition called Eye for Colour. It's packed with hands-on exhibits and interactive displays, and it explores the endless ways in which colour shapes our world. Now there are forty exhibits altogether that come under six main sections. Sadly, I haven't got time to tell you about them all today, so let me just give you a taste of what's on offer. So to start off, there's a section simply entitled "Seeing Colour," which is, well, as the title suggests, about how we do just that. And it's a good starting point because basically, you look at the museum gallery through a giant eyeball that's standing on a circular foot. What you don't know is that this houses a 32-inch camera and screen, and the overall effect of these is quite amazing. Another section that's very interesting is called Color in Culture. Here, there are a number of activities designed to illustrate the powerful links that exist between colour and certain aspects of our lifestyle, and this is done through a range of images and objects. You can visit the colour cafe that contains meals that really make you question how conditioned you are. How hungry do you feel if you're faced with a plate of pink and green fried eggs and blue sausages, for example? This section also includes activities that give visitors some idea of what it's like to view the world with a visual disability, which is something that many people have to do. Then there's a colour in nature section, designed to illustrate the many amazing colours that we see everywhere around us, from rainbows to autumn leaves, and to give us an idea of what it's like surviving in the external environment. So you can try camouflaging yourself. This really is one for the kids, dressing up in a suit and then selecting a background where, to all intents and purposes, you disappear. And you can look at the world through the eyes of a dog or fish. What do these creatures really see? I'd recommend ending the trip with a visit to the Mood Room, which explores the influence of colour on the way we feel. Here, you can lie back and listen to music as a projector subtly alters the lighting in the room, and with it, the atmosphere. 
How does each colour affect your emotions? You'll be surprised. Morning, Stratton Festival box office. Morning, Stratton Festival box office. How can I help you? Oh, hello. My family and I are on holiday in the area, and we've seen some posters about the festival this week. Could you tell me about some of the events, please? Of course. First of all, are there still tickets available for the jazz band on Saturday? There are, but only fifteen pounds. The twelve pound seats have all been sold. Okay, and the venue is the school, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The secondary school. Make sure you don't go to the primary school by mistake. And there's an additional performer who isn't mentioned on the posters. Carolyn Hart is going to play with the band. Oh, I think I've heard her on the radio. Doesn't she play the oboe or flutes or something? Yes, the flute. She usually plays with symphony orchestras, and apparently this is her first time with a jazz band. Well, I'd certainly like to hear her. Then the next thing I want to ask about is the duck races. I saw a poster beside a river. What are they exactly? Well, you buy a yellow plastic duck, or as many as you like. They're a pound each, and you write your name on each one. There'll be several races. Depending on the number of ducks taking part, and John Stevens, a champion swimmer who lives locally, is going to start the races. All the ducks will be launched into the river at the back of the cinema. Then they'll float along the river for 500 meters, as far as the railway bridge. And are there any prizes? Yes, the first duck in each race to arrive at the finishing line wins its owner free tickets for the concert on the last night of the festival. You said you can buy a duck. I'm sure my children will both want one. They're on sale at a stall in the market. You can't miss it. It's got an enormous sign showing a couple of ducks. Okay, I'll go there this afternoon. I remember walking past there yesterday. Now, could you tell me something about the flower show, please? Well, admission is free, and the show is being held in Bythewaite Hall. Sorry, how do you spell that? B. Y, T H, W A I, T E, Bythewait. Is it easy to find? I'm not very familiar with the town yet. Oh, you won't have any problem. It's right in the centre of Stretton. It's the only old building in the town, so it's easy to recognise. I know it. I presume it's open all day. Yes, but if you'd like to see the prizes being awarded for the best flowers. You'll need to be there at five o'clock. The prizes are being given by a famous actor, Kevin Shapless. He lives nearby and gets involved in a lot of community events. Gosh, I've seen him on TV. I'll definitely go to the prize giving. Right.、I've、seen a list of plays that are being performed this week, and I'd like to know which are suitable for my children and which ones my husband and I might go to. How old are your children? Five and seven. What about the mystery of Muldoon? That's aimed at five to ten-year-olds. So if I take my children, I can expect them to enjoy it more than I do. I think so. If you'd like something for yourself and your husband, and leave your children with a babysitter, you might like to see Fire and Flood. It's about events that really happened in Stretton two hundred years ago, and children might find it rather frightening.
Sorry I'm late. Hi, Jeremy, no problem. Well, we'd better work out where we are on our project, I suppose. Yeah, I've looked at the drawings you've done for my story, The Forest, and I think they're brilliant. They really create the atmosphere I had in mind when I was writing it. Oh, I'm glad you like them. There are just a few suggestions I'd like to make. Go ahead. Now, I'm not sure about the drawing of the cave. It's got trees all around it, which is great, but the drawing's a bit too static, isn't it? Mm. I think it needs some action. Yes, there's nothing happening. Perhaps I should add the boy, Malcolm, isn't it? Mm. He would be walking up to it. Yes, let's have Malcolm in the drawing. Mm. And what about putting in a tiger? The one that he makes friends with a bit later. Maybe it could be sitting under a tree, washing itself. And the tiger stops in the middle of what it's doing when it sees Malcolm walking past. That's a good idea. OK, I'll have a go at that. Then there's the drawing of the crowd of men and women dancing. They're just outside the forest, and there's a lot going on. That's right. You wanted them to be watching a carnival procession, but mm. I thought it would be too crowded. Do you think it works like this? Yes, I like what you've done. The only thing is... Could you add Malcolm to it without changing what's already there? Mm. What about having him sitting on the tree trunk on the right of the picture? Yes, that would be fine. And do you want him watching the other people? No, he's been left out of all the fun, so I'd like him to be crying. Mm. That'll contrast nicely with the next picture, where he's laughing at the clowns in the carnival. Right, I'll do that. And then the drawing of the people ice skating in the forest. Mm, I wasn't too happy with that one. Because they're supposed to be skating on grass, aren't they? That's right, and it's frozen over. At the moment, it doesn't look quite right. Mm, I see what you mean. I'll have another go at that. Mm, and I like the wool hats they're wearing. Maybe you could give each of them a scarf as well? Yeah, that's easy enough. They can be streaming out behind the people to suggest they're skating really fast. Mm, great. Well, that's all on the drawings. Right. So you finish writing your story and I just need to finish illustrating it. And my story and your drawings are done. So the next thing is to decide what exactly we need to write about in the report that goes with the stories and how we're going to divide the work. Right, Helen. What do you think about including a section on how we planned the project as a whole, Jeremy? That's probably quite important. Yeah, well, you've had most of the good ideas so far. <laughs> how do you feel about drafting something? Then we can go through it together and discuss it. OK, that seems reasonable. And I could include something on how we came up with the ideas for our two stories, couldn't I? Well, I've started writing something about that, so why don't you do the same and we can include the two things? Right. So what about our interpretation of the stories? Do we need to write about what we think they show, like the value of helping other people, all that sort of thing? That's going to come up later, isn't it? Mm. I think everyone in the class is going to read each other's stories and come up with their own interpretations which we're going to discuss. Oh, I missed that. So it isn't going to be part of the report at all? No. But we need to write about the illustrations because they're an essential element of children's experience of reading the stories. Mm. It's probably easiest for you to write that section, as you know more about drawing than I do. Maybe, but I find it quite hard to write about. I'd be happier if you did it. OK. So when do you think we can...
Joe, you know I'm giving a presentation in our film studies class next week. Yes. Well, could we discuss it? I could do with getting someone else's opinion. Of course, Katie. What are you going to talk about? It's about film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. I've got very interested in all the different approaches that film directors take. Uh huh. So I thought I'd start with Janetti, who's a professor of film and literature, and in one of his books he came up with a straightforward classification of film adaptations based on how faithful they are to the original plays and novels. Right. I've already made some notes on that. So I just need to sort those out before the presentation. I thought that next I'd ask the class to come up with the worst examples of Shakespeare adaptations that they've seen, and to say why. That should be more fun than having their favourite versions. Yes, I can certainly think of a couple. <laughs> right. Next, I want to talk about Rachel Malco. I came across something on the internet about her work on film adaptations, and I was thinking of showing some film clips to illustrate her ideas. Will you have enough time, though, both to prepare and during the presentation? After all, I doubt if you'll be able to find all the clips you want.、Mm, perhaps you're right. Okay, well, I'd better do some slides instead. Saying how various films relate to what she says, that should encourage discussion.、Mm. Next, I want to say something about how plays may be chosen for adaptation, because they're concerned with issues of the time when the film is made. You mean things like patriotism or the role of government? Exactly. It's quite tricky. But I've got a few ideas I'd like to discuss. And finally, I want to talk about a few adaptations that I think illustrate a range of approaches, and make some comments on them. Do you know the Japanese film Ran? I haven't seen it. It was based on Shakespeare's King Lear, wasn't it? That's right. It was a very loose adaptation. Using the same situation and story, but moving it to 16th century Japan instead of 16th century Britain. So, for example, the king's daughters become sons, because in Japanese culture at that time, women couldn't succeed to the throne. Okay, I hope you're going to talk about the 1993 film of Much Ado About Nothing. I think that's one of the best Shakespeare films. It really brings the play to life, doesn't it? Yes, I agree. And I think filming it in Italy, where the play is set, makes you see what life was like at the time of the play. Absolutely right. What's next?、Uh, next, I thought Romeo and Juliet, the 1996 film, which moves the action into the present day. Yes. It worked really well, I thought, changing the two feuding families in the original to two competing business empires, even though they're speaking in the English of the original play. You'd expect it would sound really bizarre, but I found I soon got used to it. Me too. Then I thought I'd include a real Hollywood film. One that's intended to appeal to a mass commercial audience. There must be quite a number of those. Yes, but I've picked the 1996 film of Hamlet. It included every line of the text, but it's more like a typical action hero movie. There are loads of special effects, but no unifying interpretation of the play. All show and no substance. Exactly. Then there's Prospero's books based on The Tempest. That was really innovative from a stylistic point of view. Didn't it include dance and singing and animation as well as live actors? Yes, it did. I also want to mention Looking for Richard, D. 
Did you ever see it? No, but I've read about it. It was a blend of a documentary with a few scenes from Richard III, wasn't it? That's right. It's more a way of looking into how people nowadays connect with the playwright. The play is really just the starting point. And that'll be where I finish. Well, it sounds as though it'll be very interesting.